So well, it is uh, 10 a.m. by Tomsk time zone, and it is. I think it is time to start our conference, and it is my great pleasure to open this conference and uh, to say thank you very much to all the participants from the organizers. Uh, Andrei Lisnin is now uh, at the flight from Tomsk to Kazan, so he sends his greetings to all the participants. And it is my pleasure to uh, uh, give uh, the rules to Akio Kawauchi, who will be the chairman for the first uh, opening session of our conference. Akio? Okay, thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, the, uh, let's start. Anyway. The first speaker of this conference is Professor Ru Kaufman from University of Illinois at Chicago. The title is Recondi Connection number of vortex nodes. Please start. Okay, here we go. Um, let me see. I think I can activate this. Just a moment. There. All right. So you can see this and you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Definitely. And what about this little point? Oh, where's my pointer? I guess you won't see a pointer. All right. I might switch to another version of this so you could see a pointer, but the title of the talk is Knotted Vortices and Reconnection, and you'll see what this means in a moment. What you're looking at here is a 3D printed uh, knot made from a self-repelling knot in a, in a computer program. Uh, it has a nice physical look to it, I think. Um, I want to recall for you some history and to show you some films, and then we'll get to the mathematics of it. Um, Lord Kelvin uh, in uh, Sir William Thompson in the 1800s had the idea that atoms uh, were modeled by uh, knotted vortices in the luminiferous ether. Um, this was a theory in the 1800s that was quite popular for a while and led people to begin to try to study knotted vortices. But there's the question of the stability of the vortices and also the question of the ether, um, because after a while, people began to be skeptical about the properties of the ether and eventually revised the ether into just studying manifolds. And uh, so this theory didn't survive, but the idea of knots in physics and knotted physics at the micro level seems to survive. But, um, and this is a picture from those times showing you, you the popularity of this idea. This was not from scientists, but from meditators who felt that they had seen knots in their visions, uh, Ledbetter and Bassant. And, um, and then, as I said, the theory fell into disrepair for a long time. If you were to read a wiki, I, don't, I haven't looked at this wiki recently, but this is a wiki uh, on the history of knot theory. And you'll see, if you look at it, I won't read all of it, that it goes back to Gauss and listing and talks about the Gauss linking number, talks about Peter Tate's experiments with vortices, with smoke rings, and Thompson's ideas, and the wavelengths and Hofflink and Tate conjectures and so on, and things that Maxwell did. Um, and uh, then uh, at the end, it says, when the luminiferous ether was not detected in the Michelson-Morley experiment, the vortex theory became completely obsolete. And knot theory ceased to be of great scientific interest. Um, but this wiki is, of course, wrong. Um, it is true that the luminiferous ether uh, was lost, but the knot theory has not been lost in science. But um, the matter of getting a knotted vortex, which was Kelvin's idea, one didn't actually see a knotted vortex until a few years ago, um, when William Irvine and his graduate student, Dustin Kleckner, produced knotted vortices in water. Um, no one had actually made a knotted vortex or seen a knotted vortex up to that time. So, um, so until 2012, when this paper was published, 
one didn't truly have a revival of Kelvin's ideas, but, but with knotted vortices being real, albeit at a macroscopic level, um, it be, they become of physical interest. Uh, and how did these fellows do this? Well, I wanted to show you the films of this a little bit, and then we'll talk about the other things. So uh, if you make a template like the one that's indicated here, whose cross section is teardrop, and you uh, have fluid flowing past the template, then it will vortex along the upper edge. Um, and uh, if, you, um, if you think of taking the template and pulling it down quickly through a fluid, then uh, a ring vortex will be emitted from the upper part of it. And they did that to create vortices. And then they made knotted templates, as you can see in this slide. Um, and they used 3D printing to uh, enable them to tinker with the knotted templates and get them to work well. And over here, you see a, a picture of an unknotted vortex from that method, and also a picture of a knotted vortex. And let's look at a movie of theirs. This is the unknotted vortex. High speed photography. These vortices tend to disintegrate quickly. Um, even here, you see it beginning to disintegrate. Here is the knotted vortex. I'll do that one again so you can see it. But it's quite clearly knotted, and the high-speed photography does a good job. But even here, you can see that it's fragile and, and disintegrating fast, although not here. This is a still photograph. But let's go back. Whoop. Let's go back. I want you to see the bottom uh, of that. There's that one. And then here's this one. And did you see it was knotted? Um, we could... Um, we could play a game and get a slower version of this, but I won't do it now. Anyway, they produce knotted vortex. And they find that one of the ways in which these knotted vortices disintegrate um, is very interesting in mathematically, topologically. It's called reconnection, or we might call it re-smoothing. What happens is that vortex lines get near one another, interact, and reconnect. So it's just like what we call re-smoothing. Two lines break apart and reconnect. Now, what happens in the intermediate is a kind of a chaotic thing, which is hard to describe. But the end result is very simple. You start with two lines and you end with a reconnection. And if you were to orient, I wonder if I have a slide for this. Let me see. Uh, maybe I didn't have a slide for this. I would like to show you a slide that illustrates this. So let me go over here and get it. A diagram, because the diagram helps to understand the rough edge of what happens here. Sorry. There we go. That's the diagram I wanted to put and forgot to put in the slideshow. All right. So this is this is the vortex line, and this uh, little curling circle represents the fluid going around the vortex line. And as you see, we can use the right-hand rule to assign a direction to the vortex line in relation to where the fluid flows around the line. And you also see that the fluid in between two lines will flow naturally in the same direction if the lines have opposite orientation. So oppositely oriented vortex lines can undergo an interaction, and they do, and that's the re-smoothing. So in, um, in a knot diagram, a re-smoothing could happen or a reconnection can happen if you have two oppositely oriented lines, and it would go like that. And you will also notice that the writhe of the diagram, the sum of the signs of the crossings, does not change under reconnection. So here I have a trefoil, and I underwent reconnection into a hop link, and the writhe is still two, the sum of the crossing signs. And then it went under, underwent another reconnection over here and ended up being an unknot, uh, but still the same ride as before. So that's the point I wanted to make with that diagram. We can go back to my slideshow now. 
So reconnection can be diagrammed and it corresponds to oriented resmoothing. Um, Kleckner and Irvine and I, we wrote a paper about untying vortex knots using a method that they understood very well and I understood very little called the uh, evolution of the gross -Piet pietaevsky equation, which is a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And in this nonlinear Schrodinger equation, you can look at the phase constant surfaces and they will turn out to be one dimensional uh, curves and they, and they undergo evolutions. And you will find that they undergo evolutions that involve reconnection. So you get very nice computer modeling of reconnection like that. And, um, and so that's another way to investigate reconnection in a quasi-physical way by using the evolution of a differential equation. And when you do that, you could start with something like 6-2 here and watch how it evolves under this kind of uh, differential evolution. You see a reconnection and then another reconnection and a yet another reconnection. And finally, we end up with some detritus and unknot. And if you look here, here's the knot 6-2 and here's a link. And then here's the trefoil knot and here's a hop link and here's the unknot. And we already saw in my diagrams how a trefoil knot could undergo a reconnection to become a hop link and the hop link could undergo a reconnection to become an unknot. And that's two reconnections. And then we had two more. So we seem to have one, two, three, four reconnections getting it down to the unknot. And it's natural to ask what's the least number of reconnections that you would need in order to get the knot down to an unknot or an unlink. And uh, this is what happened here um, for, and I'm going to think about these by enlarging my arena. I have that a reconnection can be thought of in time as a saddle point. You start with an oriented, oppositely oriented pair of lines and you go through a saddle point to another oppositely oriented pair of lines in one direction or another, those are saddles. But in the topological context, we also think of births and deaths. Now the births and deaths are a way of enlarging the context so that we can think about surfaces that are traced out by the reconnection process. And so for topological purposes, this is cobordisms of knots. And we can think about the genus of surfaces that are produced in space time, if you like, or in four dimensions. So in this cobordism, at the bottom, you see that we underwent one reconnection, one birth, one reconnection, and one uh, little bit of evolution, and it was genus zero. On the other hand, in this case, on the right, we went through a reconnection that gave us two circles, and then another reconnection that brought us back to a single circle, and we created some genus in the surface that's traced in four space. And so you could look at, um, at the evolution for a trefoil knot, the one that we were looking at before, where I went through one reconnection to get to a hop link in the middle and another reconnection to get to an unlink at the bottom. And the surface that's traced in four space, the world line of this object is genus one. And so we can think about the relationship between genus and reconnection number. And we see that every time you have a bit of genus, you're going to have a single reconnection number. Every increment of genus corresponds to, um, to two reconnections. Each hole in the surface corresponds to two reconnections. So if we went back to 6-2, then we see that what had happened in that movie, what had happened in the differential equations evolution was that over on the lower left, there was a, there was a reconnection bringing us to this link. And then that link underwent a reconnection with itself, uh, with, it, with its other component over here and brought us back to a trefoil knot. And then the trefoil knot underwent some reconnections and it took four altogether. However, a topologist could remark that a single crossing switch can be accomplished with two reconnections. Let's see that. 
That's important as a topological remark, but it may not be so physical, but it's still, it's important. So here's a crossing and uh, I put a little twist nearby and then I make sure the twist has an oppositely oriented edge and I go through a saddle. And now I have a Rademeister two move. I have an underlying curve and I pull it back and push it back over the top and go back through one more time reconnection. And I'm back to the knot again, uh, and uh, I have switched the crossing. Um, you'll notice the rive hasn't changed in the process. Important to see that. But the point is that the crossing switch can be accomplished with only two reconnections. So we could go back to 6-2. For, well, for example, before I go back to 6-2, I could accomplish the trefoil reconnection using that idea if I wanted to. I could take the trefoil and I could isotop it by uh, a little um, rise preserving isotopy, in fact, to get a couple of curls in there. And then I use this nearby curl to the crossing to switch the crossing. Now I'm unknotted, right? I'm unlinked rather. Um, it hasn't helped me, I'm still linked. But um, one more and I become unknotted. So I use two, just like I did before. And in the process, I went into the link and then back into the knot. Um, nothing startling there, just illustrating how crossing switching could do it, but it didn't happen that way in the physical process. But 6-2 is another matter. 6-2 has unknotting number one. And if you switch the crossing in the middle there, you get an unknot. And so that can be accomplished with two reconnections. And so 6-2 can be undone with two reconnections. It just didn't happen in the physical model that we were looking at. Here's a picture of 6-2 happening that way. If we, put, if we took the middle crossing and had a little curl near it, and then started there, we could undergo by um, a, going through a reconnection, pulling the, that back and pushing it back over the top and reconnecting again, and we have an unknot. So you can imagine that something like that might happen physically, but it certainly required some special conditions for it to pull back and come back over. And I don't know what those conditions would be. So, um, we do need to go back to those differential equations models and try them again in the light of these remarks. We haven't done that. Um, so we've seen that a physical sequence of reconnections takes six two to the unknot, as I said. Um, but we want some lower bounds for the number of needed reconnections for a knotted vortex. So I'm going to let R of K be the least number of reconnections needed to transform a knot to a collection of unknotted circles. And you can get some lower bounds easily with the classical signature of a knot. I'll explain in a moment. But the signature of the trefoil is minus two, and the signature of six two is minus two. Those absolute values two, those mean something in this regard of having two reconnections needed. What's the situation? The situation is this. We know from Murasugi's work long ago that the signature of the knot is less than or equal to two times the four ball genus, the least genus of a surface bounding the knot in the four ball. So if you believe Murasugi's theorem, we know that the genus, um, two, twice the genus is less than or equal to the reconnection number. That's what we remarked before. Every hole could be at least two reconnections. So therefore, the signature is less than twice the genus is less than or equal to the reconnection number. So the absolute value of the signature of the knot is a lower bound on the reconnection number. There's an easy classical one. Um, I won't remind you about the definition of the signature, but I am reminding you by flashing the slide. I just won't talk about it. Um, but I do want to talk about surfaces that bound a knot and how these are related to the classical ciphered surface of the knot. So here's a knot 
And if I do oriented smoothings, uh, oriented smoothings, not re-smoothings, but replacing the crossing by a smoothing in an oriented way at every crossing, and then I bound each of the resulting circles, cipher circuits, with a disk, and then add back in little twists for each of the crossings, I obtain an orientable surface whose boundary is the knot. This is the classical ciphered surface. And I want to use that in thinking about surfaces that might arise in the reconnection process. In order to do that, I'm going to think about the ciphered surface in a slightly different way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, at every crossing, I'm going to go through a reconnection at that crossing. Let me um, point. Uh, right here, you see I have oppositely oriented edges and I can go through a reconnection there and I'll go through a reconnection here and I'll go through a reconnection here. And as you see, the result of that will give me a set of circles. And those are just exactly the same as the ciphered circles, except that we're preserving a little bit of writhe. And these circle, so you see that we could bound them with disks into the four ball. So, um, so that means that we can construct the ciphered surface as a surface bounding the knot into the four ball by going through one reconnection at each crossing and then bounding off the resulting circles into the four ball. And we obtain a surface in the four ball whose genus is exactly the same as the genus of the ciphered surface. And in fact, this surface that I have described for you into the four ball is the result of taking the ciphered surface in three space and gently pushing it into the four ball, keeping the boundary in three space. But I've described it by reconnection this way. So that means that we have an upper bound on the reconnection number. The upper bound on the reconnection number is going to be related to the number of reconnections you need to make from your ciphered surface in order to get to an unknot. So the tri most trivial way to do it is to just go ahead and do it at every crossing, but that isn't necessarily the most efficient way. So for example, in the case of the trefoil, we can get to an unlink in three, but we didn't need to get to an unlink in three. We could have just done two of these. So you see, there is this relationship with the ciphered surface. Let's go back to the slideshow. So if I have a classical knot diagram and it has C of K crossings and S of K ciphered circles, then the genus of the ciphered surface is given by one half of C of K minus S of K plus one, I claim. Um, and I leave it to you to prove that by yourself by checking it with the Euler formula. The Euler formula says, that two minus two G is equal to vertices minus edges plus faces for the for a decomposition of the surface. And you have a decomposition of the surface coming from the way I described the ciphered surface and you make the counts correctly and you'll see that that's what happens for a knot. And for a link, I have to add a term involving the number of components. So twice the ciphered genus is the number of crossings minus the number of ciphered circles plus one. We'll come back to that. So we have the following, that if I have the four ball genus for a link and I consider the reconnection number for that link, then twice the four ball genus is less than or equal to the reconnection number. And in the case of signature for link, I can augment what I said before and count the number of components as well. We'll see how that works. Um, and we have then the following theorem, that if K is a positive link, this is the most general theorem I can make at the moment. If K is a positive link, then the four ball genus of K is equal to the ciphered genus for any positive diagram of the, of the link K. And so if K has a positive diagram, 
then the reconnection number is going to be greater than or equal to twice the four ball genus, which is C of K minus S of K plus one. And in fact, we're going to see that it's equal to it. And we know this by Rasmussen's invariant. Rasmussen's invariant uh, and, and a couple of papers past the one that Rasmussen wrote tell you this about the least genus in the four ball that, that's given by the Seifert genus. So we can apply that here. So, um, so I claim that if I have a positive link, then the reconnection number is exactly given by this count. And we'll see by doing some examples how that looks. You take the number of crossings minus the number of cipher circles and add one, and you have the genus that you want. You have the reconnection number that you want. So we already know that the reconnection number is greater than or equal to that number from Rasmussen. And it suffices to give a sequence of exactly this many reconnections that will undo it. And we also know that we can just use every crossing. So C of K will, re will suffice, but I'll show you some examples to see what I'm saying, but I'll read it. If we look at the Seifert circles, then we can locate S minus one sites of these that if connected will produce an unknot. And then we don't have to perform connections at everybody. We just perform C of K minus S of K minus one kind of reconnections and we're done. And that gives the answer. So you need to see an example in order to understand what I just said. Uh, let me not use that example, but use this one. Here is a torus knot of type PQ. Um, P equals three and Q equals four in this case. So we have three little braid, four little braids of type three here. And you'll notice that the number of crossings in the PQ torus knot is P minus one times Q because each of the little braids has P minus one crossings in it. And there are Q of those braids. So the number of crossings is P minus one times Q. And the number of ciphered circles is P because as you see below, when you smooth all those crossings, you get exactly three circles in this three case and P in general, all right? So, um, so I'm just doing the calculation to show you how this works out. So twice the ciphered genus of K is, two, is the C of K minus S of K plus one. C of K is PQ minus Q, S of K is, is minus P and uh, plus one. And that is equal to P minus one times Q minus one. So that tells us that the reconnection number for the PQ torus knot is P minus one times Q minus one. And of course, Rasmussen proves that the four ball genus is equal to P minus one times Q minus one over two. So these results are dovetailing into one another. But um, what did I say about knowing how to reconnect? Well, um, I've done an example here that shows you what I mean. Here's an arbitrary positive knot, some positive knot. And I have, I have, uh, smooth all the crossings in the ciphered form over here. That's the same as doing a certain, uh, doing reconnections at all of them, but I have smoothed all of them, all right? I have, I have um, done that. And now you see a collection of ciphered circles. I think I wish to point again. So here's the collection of ciphered circles, but we don't want to do reconnection at every crossing. So what we're going to do is we're going to leave this one connected to that one, this one connected to that one, and this one connected to that one. We can find a chain of ciphered circles, each connected to the other, and leave the chain alone. Leaving the chain alone, but smoothing everyone else gives you an unknot. So by doing exactly the reconnections in the complement of the chain, the chain is checkmarked. We're doing the reconnections in the complement of the chain. We end up with this fellow here, an unknot. And therefore, the reconnection number is exactly equal to 
C of K minus S of K plus one. So I can always reconnect it to an unknot by using C of K minus S of K plus one reconnections. And that is greater than or equal to the reconnection number as we already knew. And therefore the reconnection number of this positive knot is exactly seven in this case. And the same argument applies to the um, torus knot. You see, in the case of the torus knot, we could have left these two alone, and then we would have done one, two, three, four, five, six reconnections, and uh, two times three is six, and that's the answer in this case. So you see how it works. Oh, I'm sorry, I made the wrong choice there. I wanted to go back to my uh, slideshow. Okay, so I think these examples illustrate exactly what's going on for you. Rasmussen tells us that that's a lower bound and geometric construction using the idea of the cobordism ciphered surface shows us that it in fact is equal. And so we know the reconnection numbers for all of these knots, all positive knots. And, and this opens the book again on doing experiments with these, because I'm sure that if we do experiments using the gross piatevsky uh, differential equation, we'll find that in many cases, the reconnection number will be much larger than this. And in some cases, it will be equal to it. It'd be very interesting to see how it relates to the known reconnection number for these knots. And there's a nice infinite class of them. Here's a nice example for a link, a simple example. If we analyze the link over here on the left, I've produced its ciphered circles. And we see that the number of crossings is four and the number of ciphered circles is three and C minus S plus one is four minus three plus one is two. So this will reconnect in two. And um, how do you see that? Let me um, again, go so I can point. I, uh, how do I do it? Well, I'm going to look at the, uh, I'm going to undo, I'm going to reconnect here and reconnect here and not reconnect there or there. And uh, the result is that the three cipher circles are connected in a chain. This one up here, sorry, connected in a chain here. And uh, that that's all I needed. Um, so, um, I needed, uh, I'm sorry, they're connected in a chain here and up here, right? Um, and then we did the, the um, re-smoothings, the reconnections on the other two crossings, and it gives us an unknot. So this went down to an unknot in two, but it might, if you chose the wrong reconnection, get you a higher number. And I would expect that in an experiment, this would easily happen. So for example, if the reconnection happened along the middle circuit here, like that, we would end up with two hop links. And assuming that it didn't go backward, the hop links would each require a reconnection of their own in order to become undone. And so we would get to unknotted things in three rather than two if we did it in the wrong way. So as you see, there are a lot of experiments and one can think of cascades of reconnections and the various reconnection numbers that will come out of the cascades in doing this sort of thing. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep choosing the wrong guy there. All right, let's go back to the slideshow. There. Okay, so that's the main result. Um, and um, it, it would be uh, interesting in, in this talk if I uh, to review how Rasmussen's theorem works, but that's a little beyond doing it in this talk, so we won't. But I would like to know what happens in experiments now very much. Uh, I want to show you something else about topology change. I'll go back to uh, movies for a moment, and then maybe we are stopping a little early on this talk. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you that this can happen in a real life situation. 
that you have a line vortex and it has a little curl in it and the curl does slip under an edge and then a, a reconnection occurs uh, at the crossing. It's just like what I was telling you about. It really does happen and you get a link. So you, got, you increase the complexity of the topology instead of decreasing it. And you might wonder, how could that happen? But it does happen. And it happens in an experiment beautifully done by Alexienko in Novosibirsk. And you probably couldn't see that very well, but I'm going to show it to you more slowly. Here is the, the loop. Oh, and I should explain that Professor Alexienko's experiment involves a turbine. So it, it's simpler than the Irvine experiment, but it isn't a closed loop vortex. It's a turbine, water rotating in a long tube, which is wider at the bottom than it is at the top. And the wider at the bottom than it is at the top allows some things to float upward. And that's what happened here. You can see the width getting larger as it goes down. And you can see that something funny happened there, but uh, hard to tell. So let's look at what happened. This, this loop is floating upward. And it floats upward underneath the other part of the vortex and keeps on moving upward a little bit and it's starting to get close to another one. Notice, by the way, the orientation. If you put an orientation down on this and then walked along it, it'd be coming back up here. So these are oppositely oriented. They can interact and they do interact They start getting closer and they interact. And I, I have no film, I have no pictures of the interaction from here to the reconnection. I have this shot and the reconnection has happened. That's it, just like that. And now you see, because this lasso was going around the other one, when this reconnects, you end up with a link. So in the uh, context of Professor Alexienko's experiment, it is possible to have um, a bit of line slip underneath a bit of line and reconnect like we were seeing in the crossing switch. And for the topology, in fact, to become more complicated. So it's not impossible that some of the topologists' ideas that are in here may happen in reality. And this is what we just saw. So I thank you, but I think in the light of the fact that we have a couple more minutes, I would like to show you a little more phenomenology. Oops. I want to show you a little more phenomenology. This is another movie from Alexienko's lab, but well, let's run it at normal speed. Now there you see a movie of the actuality of the reconnection. just wanting to center that a little bit for you. So the, they're coming together, they're near one another, they're getting very close, they interact. And then the interaction is obviously quite complex. And you see that there's microstructure going on here. You see those filaments coming. So you end up with these filaments of uh, vortexing going on in between the larger parts, which are stabilizing and forming the reconnected vortex. And the filament remains for a while in between them as they float away. So it would be very interesting to understand 
better the details, the actual physical details of, of this. Let me see if I have another one that I would like to show you. Right. In this case, what did you see? You saw the vortex getting near to itself. The, you saw two edges of the vortex getting near to one another and filaments happening between them. Quite an intensity of interaction, but there, there was enough momentum on the larger vortex so that it didn't reconnect, it just passed by. So it looks like a Feynman diagram for the physical interaction between two things involving an interchange of particles, right? Only all this is a macroscopic level thing, not quantum. Um, and very interesting um, fluid dynamics going on that um, one would like to understand how to model it or how to model it with some simplification so that one could think about extra topological things that are going on here. So. For the topologists, you think of, well, there will be tubes between them, and uh, how many tubes will there be? And many questions that you can ask. So um, so I thought I would share that with you um, because it is really quite remarkable. And uh, so what have we done today? We've talked about some physical vortices. We've talked about the Kelvin theory. Um, we've talked about how one can actually find the reconnection number, the least number of reconnections needed to unknot a knot for positive knots, which includes torus knots, and that there's a simple formula for that involving the Seifert circles, and that the phenomena of reconnection is, a, is really quite a fascinating physical phenomenon that, um, with, with these remarks, is related to some of our favorite topological invariants. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for, for your nice talk. Uh, there is a question or a comment? Okay, so one, one question is, uh, it's uh, your, uh, the connection is a uh, oriented, yeah, cobordism is an oriented surface. Yeah, it's a uh, no oriented case. There is no oriented I'm, surface. I'm not, I'm not sure okay. I understood the question. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, the connection is a cobordism of, of not. Cobordism surface. Well, it's, well uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, a, so I, what I'm saying is, okay. I'm saying the following. Um, yeah. That, Two knots are coordinate if yeah. there is an orientable surface in four space between them. Mm -hmm. Cobordisms can be uh, can always be uh, delineated by a sequence of isotopies, births, deaths, and reconnections. If you want to use the term reconnection, All right? Saddle point moves. Okay. So, um, so we can ask of a cobord of of two knots. What is the least number of reconnections in a cobordism between them? Yeah. Right. And that would be a reconnection number for a pair of knots. And I'm defining the reconnection number of a given knot is the least number of saddle points in a surface that bounds the knot. And that's the same as the least number of, um, for a knot, it's the same as the least number of holes, it's the same as the genus. So if you know the genus in the four ball of the knot, you basically know the reconnection number. In the case of a link, there are some further reconnections that can happen in terms of link components melding with one another. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, is there other question or comment? Uh, excuse me, may I ask you? That was a question. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, first, uh, thank you for interesting talk. Uh, I have one uh, question. 
as I understood in this case, we are considering the, uh, the, the situation in, in R3. And the, the situation in R3, user uh, R3, R3. Oh yeah, I, in R3, certainly, yes. Then, uh, of course, uh, as I know, the similar work can be done for the Lovely speaking virtual nodes in the circuit, uh, not in R3, but the second circuit. Yes, yeah, certainly. Way. For example, I can make the same theorem, exactly the same theorem yeah. for positive virtual knots. A positive right. virtual link um, has the reconnection number with exactly the same conclusion because of the work oh, yes, that we right. did with because of work that uh, that I did with Heather Dye and Aaron Kastner using Kovana homology and a Rasmussen invariant for virtual knots. So the same uh, conclusions. You get exactly yes. the same conclusions for a reconnection number for virtual knots. But there you're thinking of everything is stabilized. Mm. Right, yes, you, yes. you don't care about the number of handles in the surface if you can get rid of them. It's virtual knot theory. Um, if you wanted yeah. to ask the further question, of the knot is actually in a specific genus thickened surface and you ask the same question, uh, then we could probably do some work there too, but we'd have to use a version of Kavana homology for the, that's a little more special to the surface. Oh, thank you. Oh, then another question is then, is there a corresponding, uh, how to say, situation in physics for the knots in the second surface or other study manifold? Good question. I, 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 I meant to mention it. I don't know. I don't know whether uh, there's an interest in having vortices um, restricted to being in a thickened surface. But it, uh, it might be possible to do computer experiments with them, though. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> there is another question. Okay, so thank you very much. Nice talk. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, next talk will begin with eleven hundred. Just to rest.